This episode is dedicated to the memory of a good friend who was instrumental in making Weird Darkness what it is today. I never met Paul Spangler personally, nor did I ever speak with him on the phone, but we became good friends online after I discovered his amazing artistic talents. I hired him to create the logo we now use for Weird Darkness. After that, he created the designs that you see today in the Weird Darkness store on t-shirts, hats, and all the other items. He also helped create the book covers for some of the books we released through Weird Darkness Publishing. Sometimes Paul created something I suggested, like the old-time radio design of a monster lurking over an old radio to scare a boy who was listening to his favorite program. Other times he volunteered to create something, simply because he believed in the podcast and wanted to be involved, like the Bigfoot design during the pandemic, indicating that Bigfoot was social distancing before social distancing was cool. One of my favorite things he has created is Mine and Not for the Public, a series of Lon Chaney the Wolf Band drawings that he sent to me simply because he knew how much I loved the film and he wanted to do something nice for me. Paul was caring, compassionate, and generous, and I already miss him. Paul, this episode is for you. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Strange and bizarre activities can occur anywhere, but some places seem to be hot spots for such occurrences. Here, Reasing Hamlets and spooky spaces are not only chilling, but can also be the most intriguing destinations on the planet. From the haunted hub of Skinwalker Ranch to the weird waters of Pyramid Lake, these eerie locations are home to some of the most fascinating or disturbing incidents ever recorded, and in some cases, leaving behind freaky phenomena. At Skinwalker Ranch, a place many consider the strangest on Earth, visitors have reported everything from UFO sightings to encounters with otherworldly creatures. Meanwhile, the Bermuda Triangle has been the site of countless mysterious disappearances, baffling experts for decades. Haunted houses like 30 East Drive in West Yorkshire send shivers down the spines of even the bravest ghost hunters. It's not just buildings and locations. Entire stretches of road, like the Stocks Bridge Bypass in England and the A3 Motorway in Croatia, are infamous for ghostly apparitions and unexplained phenomena. Even natural settings, like the Puente Hills Turnbull Canyon in California, are steeped in dark legends, from satanic cults to haunted ruins. There are numerous places like these, where the line between reality and the supernatural is blurred. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… How could a person seemingly burst into flames without any external ignition source? We'll look at the chilling story of Mary Reeser and others like her that continue to baffle and intrigue both scientists and the public, leaving us to ponder the true nature of what's been termed spontaneous human combustion. The remains of nearly a dozen sex workers were carelessly discarded in the New Mexico desert between the years of 2001 and 2005, and today it is still not known who is responsible. Have you seen the mischievous spirits of Tinker Swiss Cottage or met Galena's Lady in Black? Perhaps you've had a run-in at DeKalb's Egyptian Theater. These are all areas within a short distance of each other, northwest of Chicago, that can give the Windy City spooks a run for their money. But first, from haunted houses and cursed lakes to mysterious roads where ghostly figures appear out of thin air, our planet is home to some truly chilling locations. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, 
and come with me into the weird darkness. Strange and bizarre activity can occur anywhere, and often does. However, some places and locations around the world are seemingly hot spots of such activity. These paranormal hubs are some of the most intriguing destinations on the planet, as well as some of the most disturbing and chilling. We've looked at many of these before, and for good reason, as they are home to some of the most intriguing and fascinating incidents of a paranormal or supernatural nature on record. As we will touch on later, if we can gain a collective understanding of these hotspots, we will most likely shine a light on many different and seemingly unconnected areas at once. It is a belief held in many areas of both UFO and paranormal research that there is very likely a common origin or connection that will tie these bizarre encounters together, and that journey towards understanding these strange incidents very well might start with understanding the areas that these strange locations and incidents seemingly seek out. We've shared some of these locations before, such places as Skinwalker Ranch, for example, where a whole host of strange goings-on unfold, said by some to be the strangest place on Earth. And then there are places such as the Bennington Triangle or even the Bermuda Triangle, where strange disappearances take place and have done so for decades, if not longer. There are also, of course, the many haunted houses. A good example might be the bizarre and blood-curdling happenings at 30 East Drive in West Yorkshire in England. There are also an abundance of haunted roads that we may have examined previously also. Such locations as the Stocksbridge Bypass, for example, which has a plethora of accounts of hooded figures, dancing children, and figures who appear out of nowhere in the middle of the road, or the legion of Roman soldiers who are often seen marching down the M6. Furthermore, we could turn our attention to the A3 motorway in Croatia, a road so strange that drivers are said to suffer from hallucinations and unexplained phenomena, so much that over 2,000 accidents are said to have occurred as a direct result of these bizarre actions. We've also examined some of the many haunted asylums and mental institutions around the planet, perhaps some of the strangest of which is the Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Kentucky in the U.S., or maybe we could look to the Beechworth Lunatic Asylum in Victoria in Australia. There are, though, many, many more areas of strangeness and intrigue that command our attention. Although it is little spoken of outside of paranormal circles in its home state of Nevada, Pyramid Lake is one of the strangest and most chilling locations, not only in the United States but the world. And what's more, similar to the legends of Skinwalker Ranch, the strangeness of the location is said to be the result of a curse one that, while it's been there for thousands of years, was seemingly exasperated by a bloody conflict in the mid-1800s. The Paiute tribes of the region had long called the serene and breathtakingly beautiful regions around Pyramid Lake home. However, as settlers from Europe increasingly moved west, this serenity was disturbed drastically. The explorer John C. Fremont was perhaps the first newcomer to the American shores to head west to Pyramid Lake in 1844. Compounding this were further settlers heading to the area from the east. With little regard for the surrounding forests and land reserves of the tribes, settlers began setting up towns and industrial mining operations, which included cattle ranches. This ultimately caused a severe strain on the tribe's natural food resources and essentially caused increased animosity between them and the settlers. The native tribes would begin random campaigns of murder on the settlers. In turn, the settlers began to threaten their own retribution. This would eventually result in the Paiute War, sometimes referred to as the Pyramid Lake War. This conflict was particularly bloody with losses on each side, although the native losses are suspected to be significantly higher than the 80 settlers. Eventually, a ceasefire was agreed to. Following this, much was learned of the curse of the lake from the natives. It would appear that while the reasons for the conflict was very much those involved, and each side blamed the other, 
There was an underlying feeling that the conflict was at least partly the result of the dark energy that resides in the area. According to these legends, Pyramid Lake was once the home of a mermaid race. One of these mermaids was said to have met a man from one of the local settlements in the area. They fell in love, and the man brought the mermaid to his village so they could be married. However, instead of welcoming his would-be bride, the villagers banished her from the village. The story goes that upon returning to the water, the mermaid placed a curse on the land around the lake, stating that misfortune and bad luck would curse those who resided there. Whether there is any truth to such tales is obviously open to debate, however, there is a long history of strange entities calling the waters home, and these range from demonic serpent-type entities to strange voices and the crying of babies being heard. Perhaps even more concerning, the lake is known to have a high number of accidents and drownings. Even stranger, many people appear to simply vanish into thin air, according to local sources, at least once a year during the main fishing season in the area. One of the strangest places in the world, as well as being one of the most picturesque, is California, which is home to many haunted locations, some of which have some intriguing backstories. Indeed, before the settlers took over the region, what we know of California had a long history with indigenous tribes of the area, themselves who have an abundance of legend and folklore tales that appear to, on occasion, surface in and out of the contemporary world. We've examined before, for example, the Dark Watchers, said to lurk on the mountain ranges overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and have done so, according to local legend, for thousands of years. One of the most enduring legends of the California region are of the albino creatures that lurk along Hicks Road in San Jose. In fact, accounts suggest the tales of these strange and seemingly menacing entities go back as long as there have been people in the region. The road itself is surrounded by thick woodland which these albino creatures emerge from and subsequently attack any vehicles that dare to drive along the road. When we realize that, according to legend, these albino creatures seek human flesh as part of their foodstuffs, then we can perhaps understand why some motorists will avoid the road at all costs. Those who have ventured down the road have spoken of seeing several long-abandoned vehicles along the way. Some even speak of being chased by a strange person driving a truck, itself looking as though it had been abandoned, such was the shabby and beaten-up appearance. Some accounts of the albinos of Hicks Road suggest that they live in small communities composed of shacks and are well away from the first main road. Another stretch of road in California said to be awash with strange activity is Dyer's Lane in the town of Alberta. Much like the Stocksbridge Bypass in England, it's said that strange, ghostly figures suddenly appear in the middle of the road, forcing them to swerve to avoid them. Others even speak of having rocks thrown at them from unseen attackers. Like Hicks Road, there is an intriguing backstory to the bizarre goings-on of Dyer Lane, although there is hard records of these origins. According to the records, the land the road runs through was owned previously by John and Julie Dyer in the mid-1800s. The road didn't exist at the time and was instead fields upon which the Dyers kept the cattle of their ranch. However, one evening, after discovering her husband had yet another affair, Julie Dyer is said to have murdered their youngest child before killing her husband. She would then take her own life. Upon arriving home, the eldest son seemingly went crazy from the bloodshed he witnessed. He would proceed to set fire to the whole estate, which subsequently burned to the ground. It is said that the strange and ghostly goings-on are the ghosts of the Dyer family, whose land the road now runs through. Whether the hauntings on Dyer Lane are due to the actions of the Dyer family, Griffith Park in Los Angeles is said to be haunted due to a curse placed on the land following an attempt to alter a dying man's will by a man called Don Antonio. The dying man, Don Antonio Felice, was approached by a man named Coronel as he lay on his deathbed. According to the story, he would swindle the rightful heir of the man's estates following his imminent death. He would even use a stick placed discreetly at the back of the dying man's neck in order to promote Felice to nod and essentially agree to the change. 
the rightful heir, Petronilla, would not only put a curse on the park or the land upon which it resides, but also on Coronel, the lawyer who acted on his behalf, and the judge who made the dubious agreement legal. According to the legend, Coronel's family would begin to die suddenly of mysterious circumstances, whereas the lawyer and the judge seemingly also met their ends soon after. While there are numerous apparent ghostly sightings and strange happenings in the park, it's also a location connected to the suspected murder of upcoming actress Jean Spangler, who simply vanished in 1949. The only trace of her was her handbag, which was discovered in the grounds of the park itself. However, there is also a tentative and speculative connection to the murder of Elizabeth Short, otherwise known as the Black Dahlia. A note inside her purse suggested very strongly that she had an appointment to have an abortion. One of the few doctors who would offer such discreet services was Dr. George Hodel, thought to be the killer of Short. Another seemingly picturesque place hiding a dark history is Tumble Canyon, which is part of the Puente Hills. With everything from satanic cults to curses from Native American tribes, ghostly apparitions, and even UFO sightings, Turnbull Canyon is perhaps one of the most bizarre stretches of land in the Golden State. The curses are said to come from the invading Spanish who would ignore the warnings of the native population that the land was forbidden and forced them there when they had a choice of converting to Christianity or facing death. The tribes would not convert, and it is said that their spirits remain on the land to this day. The location was also once home to an insane asylum. However, there were rumors of mistreatment at the facility as well as an air of secrecy about what went on behind its closed doors. Less than a decade after it was opened in the early 1930s, it burnt to the ground. The cause of the fire remains a mystery. The ruins, however, remain, and many adventure seekers and ghost hunters venture to the area in the hopes of witnessing something strange. According to some who have visited the ruins, it is difficult to stand there without the feeling that something is reaching into your brain. One of the most horrific incidents to take place in the ruins of the old Turnbull Canyon Asylum took place almost two decades after its destruction. A group of teenagers were in the ruins when one of them discovered an old electric shock treatment device. There was no electricity supply to the ruins, and the device was decades old. Thinking he'd give his friends a laugh, he strapped the device to his head. According to the account, the device became live, killing the teenager within seconds. Not so much one specific location, the entire town of Antioch is said to be home to a plethora of unusual and paranormal activity. There are many tales of ghostly appearances. Perhaps one of the most intriguing is that of a strange old woman who numerous fishermen claim to have seen literally flying over the waters. Is this a suggestion that the apparition has a connection to witchcraft? Even stranger, especially when we keep in mind the sightings of the white woman flying over the waters of the fishing community, are the two ghostly figures who regularly appear at the Black Diamond Mines. And what's more, these figures are known to have existed in the town in the recorded history of the town. The first is a woman who was tried and executed near the mine as a witch, referred to locally as the White Witch. The other was a young woman who was knocked down and killed by a carriage at the mine in the early 1800s. Her name was Sarah Norton. Once more, whether these sightings are more folklore and legend than actual sightings is open to debate. However, the fact that they can be traced back to actual events makes them extremely intriguing. One of the strangest locations is a white house on the outskirts of the town. According to the legends, the house was once the home of a gold miner in the region who had passed away in the 19th century. There have been numerous sightings of this ghostly gold miner, including some that have resulted in apparent conversations. As well as ghostly happenings, there are also places that seem to attract those that many would label as witchcraft or class as satanic. We've examined relatively extensively the Bell Witch from Tennessee that is said to have not only terrorized the residents of the area in the 1700s, but one particular family. These types of tales and legends are prevalent all over the world. After all, the numerous and horrific witch trials and burning of women at the stake are well documented throughout history. 
and while the vast majority, if not all, of these women were nothing short of victims of murder, there is arguably more to witchcraft than we might think. Perhaps it is our perception of what witchcraft actually is that needs to change. However, there are undoubtedly some disturbing, if interesting, places around the globe, especially when we start to throw Satanism and Satanic cults into the mix, as we will examine shortly. First, though, we'll turn our attention to Southern England and a location that is awash with legends and folklore of witches and witchcraft. In Warwickshire, in Southern England, is a location known as Mayon Hill, which has a long tradition of witchcraft. It is said that the hill itself came into being following the building of Evesham Abbey. The devil would throw a large clod of earth at the newly built church. However, according to the legend, the earth was swung away from the abbey by the Bishop of Worcester. In this region today, there are several rock formations named the Rollwright Stones. These are said to be the result of the turning to stone of an approaching army of the Danish king and an army by witches who resided in the area. How true the account might be is obviously open to debate. We looked at Turnbull Canyon in California earlier. However, it's worth our time returning to that strangest of places in order to examine a mysterious satanic cult that appeared out of nowhere in the area in the early 1930s. With the local populace, like many around the United States, still in the grip of the Depression, they would begin to hear rumors of a strange group of men and women who would take to the area at nightfall. What's more, they would wear strange black hooded robes and perform bizarre rituals and chant in an unknown language. One account of this strange group, though, stands out more than most. One evening, an unnamed witness would sneak into the wooded areas of the canyon to witness for themselves what these mysterious gatherings were all about. When they arrived, however, much to their horror, as well as the hooded members of the cult who were indeed chanting in a circle, there was a young boy strapped to a cross in the center of them. The witness watched the events for several minutes until suddenly the chanting stopped. They then watched in horror as the young boy was stabbed repeatedly by members of the cult. The witness would claim that they could see the boy still breathing by the time the attack had ceased. However, after being taken from the cross, he was simply stuffed into a sack and dumped onto a waiting cart that would take him from the scene. The witness would return to the town to alert the rest of the residents of the disturbing actions. By the time they arrived at the location, though, the cult was nowhere to be seen. In more recent times, satanic graffiti and symbolism has appeared around the area. Much like areas awash in paranormal or ghostly activity, many locations seemingly feature more UFO sightings than most. We've examined some of these previously, such as the deserts of Nevada or New Mexico, or the apparent triangular hotspot of UFO sightings in Falkirk, Scotland. However, there are others that are not perhaps so well known, but equally as strange and mysterious. Without a doubt, one of the truly strangest zones on the planet is located near the Ural Mountains in Russia, the site of the infamous Dyatlov Pass incident. The Pamanamalus Zone is otherwise known as the Molyobka Triangle, and it's home to some of the most mysterious activity on record. For example, there are bizarre and unheard of readings of electromagnetic energy. Furthermore, watches are said to stop inside the zone, while strange sounds are often heard seemingly coming out of nowhere. What's more, there are multiple reports of strange lights seen flying overhead. As well as UFOs, there are apparent sightings of yetis in the region, something that again comes up in the Dyatlov Pass case. The zone remains of intrigue to researchers, both into UFOs and general paranormal happenings. There are currently several projects in place in the area utilizing such technological equipment as infrared cameras and magnetic field sensors. Perhaps an underspoken of UFO hotspot can be found on Deer Island, which can be found off the coast of Biloxi, Mississippi, and what's more, these strange sightings go back to the early 1800s. Reports of a blue orb or a sphere of blue fire, which some locals refer to as the firewater ghost, seen moving at great speeds under the water. Many fishermen would speak of the sightings regularly. 
What's interesting here from a UFO point of view is that many orb-like UFOs are reported in other areas of the world. What's more, many UFO sightings, over half, occur over or near such bodies of water. Not just UFOs, though. The area is also home to other bizarre paranormal activity. One tale from the early 1920s tells of two fishermen who had set up camp on the island for the evening. As they were preparing food near their campsite, they suddenly heard a commotion of sorts coming from the bushes behind them. As they stood and turned toward the sound, there stood in front of them was an animated skeleton. If we turn our attention to southern Europe for a moment, we can examine Poveglia Island, which has been described as a place of evil. As we know, former insane asylums and mental institutions are often hotspots for paranormal activity. That is very much the case with the one-time insane asylum on the Italian island. However, in this instance, it would appear that there was already a history of dark and often deadly activity having taken place, and what's more, that history stretched back centuries. For example, going back to the times of the Roman Empire, plague victims would be brought to this island to spend their last agonizing days. This would take place during the 18th century where those suffering from an infectious disease were also left on the island, which was essentially a quarantine zone. What perhaps makes the island even more intriguing and perhaps has contributed to the dark past somewhat is the multiple wars and battles that have taken place there. With this in mind, then, by the time the previously mentioned asylum opened in 1922, it was understandable that there would be sightings of eerie figures and chilling voices coming out of nowhere. The asylum would continue for just over 40 years before finally being shut down. However, even after it closed its doors, the bizarre and spine-tingling activity would carry on. For example, those who have purchased plots on the island with a view to building a home there have suddenly experienced menacing and violent paranormal activity. All have left and never returned. What should we make of the abundance of strange paranormal locations right across the planet? Is there something that might connect these places, separated as they are by hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles, even across international borders? Perhaps the first thing we should consider is a connection to energy, that which we know as well as those energetic forces we are yet to discover. After all, there are many schools of thought that suggest such things as ghostly manifestations are nothing more than an imprint of energy from a previous age, like a video that replays repeatedly, although in what circumstances are not well understood. We've examined various perspectives on energy what it might be, and perhaps most importantly, what it might represent. For example, if we recall the psychic internet theory, the idea that many of these manifestations, as real as they are, are caused by the collective energies of the human mind. For example, many locations that have reputations to be haunted will be visited by people who have an expectation of what they are about to see. The same could be said for UFO hotspots. And while these apparitions are not mere hallucinations, they very well could be caused by the individual or group of individuals viewing them, as if the ghost or spirit required the energy of the human mind in order to exist. These are sometimes known as tulpas. Although we have not even approached looking at explanations for these mysterious places, in part because such an explanation is likely to remain out of our collective reach until we better understand both the realities and the mysteries of the world around us. What does appear to be the case, the more we examine both UFO sightings and strange goings-on in the supernatural world of ghosts and demonic spirits, as well as the many folklore tales and legends from around the world, it is seemingly clear that there is middle ground where these strange activities meet. With this in mind, then, we have to think that there is a connection between these areas of study and research, and that once we understand and unlock the secrets of one, we will likely understand and unlock the secrets of the others. And what's more, we just might find that these seemingly vastly different mysterious incidents and events share the same origins. Why hubs of paranormal activity exist or come into being is also something that we should be able to understand it'll put us on the road to the ultimate answers that await us all. 
coming up, how could a person seemingly burst into flames without any external ignition source? We'll look at the chilling story of Mary Reeser and others like her that continue to baffle and intrigue both scientists and the public, leaving us to ponder the true nature of what has been termed spontaneous human combustion. But first, the remains of nearly a dozen sex workers were carelessly discarded in the New Mexico desert between the years of 2001 and 2005, and today it is still not known who was responsible. That story is up next. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. In 2009, the remains of 11 women and girls were found buried in a desert in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It is widely believed that these bodies were disposed of by one singular person, a serial killer known as the West Mesa Bone Collector. But while all of the known victims have been identified, the police have yet to close this chilling case. The killer still walks among us. The remains of the victims were buried in an arroyo bank on the West Mesa between 2001 and 2005. The burial site was within city limits of Albuquerque, but the region was as yet undeveloped. However, in 2006, development expanded to the area, putting a stop to the discrete disposals in favor of building up a residential area. Considering the regularity of the burials, this could very well mean unknown victims are buried elsewhere. When the housing bubble collapse hit in 2008, development came to a halt on the west side, leaving the project unfinished. Residents living near the burial site complained of flooding, which led to the erection of a retaining wall that channeled stormwater into a retention pond. This pond just happened to be in the general area of the burial site. The water gradually exposed these forgotten bones to the surface. On February 2, 2009, a woman out walking her dog first caught a glimpse of the remains. She called the police with a report of a human bone on the West Mesa, and an investigation was subsequently launched. The police later identified the victims, who ranged between the ages of 15 and 32. The list of murdered women and girls included Jamie Barella, Monica Candelaria, Victoria Chavez, Virginia Cloven, Sylvania Edwards, Cinnamon Elks, Doreen Marquez, Julie Nieto, Veronica Romero, Evelyn Salazar, and Michelle Valdez. There was also a fetus buried with the victims. Most of the women were Hispanic. Many of them were also involved with drugs or sex work. Fifteen-year-old Sylvania Edwards was the only African-American. Originally from Lawton, Oklahoma, she was also the only victim from out of the state. Nearly two years after the discovery of the remains, the Albuquerque police released pictures of seven unidentified women who may also be victims of the West Mesa Bone Collector. The authorities have declined to explain how they came into the possession of these images, however, many of the women depicted share physical characteristics with the known victims. In the photos, some of them appear unconscious. A few days after the release of these photos, the police reported that two of the women in them were identified as still alive. If they could be tracked down, they might provide vital information about the case. While more bones were found near the initial burial site in June 2018, these were determined to be ancient remains rather than remains related to the murders. While the serial killer theory had not been taken off the table, the police have also started to investigate the murders from a sex trafficking angle. In 2010, a reward of $100,000 was offered in exchange for information on the case. So far, no one has been named as an official suspect in the murders, 
but there have been some men of significant interest. One figure of interest was pimp Fred Reynolds. He knew one of the missing women and allegedly possessed photographs of several missing sex workers. Unfortunately, he died in January 2009. Photographer and businessman Ron Irwin had his Missouri properties searched in August of 2010 in connection to the murders. He used to regularly visit the Albuquerque State Fair, and the police confiscated tens of thousands of pictures from him. Eventually, he was cleared as a suspect entirely. Convicted serial killer Scott Lee Kimball was also investigated in connection with the West Mesa murders in December of 2010, but he denied any connection to the killings. There are two unofficial suspects that remain fairly solid leads, Lorenzo Montoya and Joseph Blea. Lorenzo Montoya was residing less than three miles from the burial site at the time of the murders. Dirt trails in 2006 led directly from his trailer to the site. On two different occasions, he was arrested for assaulting sex workers and had even threatened to kill his girlfriend and bury her in Lyme. Several of his co-workers alleged that he had mentioned killing and burying women on the West Mesa. In December of 2006, he strangled a teenage sex worker to death in his trailer. The victim's boyfriend then shot him dead. It seems, coincidentally, as if the West Mesa murders stopped after this incident. Joseph Blea became of interest in the West Mesa murders in 2014 after a break in another decades-old case. Throughout the 1980s, Blea would break into the homes of girls between the ages of 13 and 15 and sexually assault them. These crimes earned him the title of the mid-school rapist. Additionally, he was suspected of killing a sex worker in 2015 after his DNA was found on the inner waistband of the victim. Evidence potentially linking Blea to the West Mesa murders included a tree tag at the burial site from a nursery that he frequented and a collection of women's underwear and jewelry not belonging to his wife or daughter. After being sentenced to prison in June of 2015 for the mid-school case, he allegedly confessed to a cellmate that he had hired the victims of the West Mesa murders. Blea denies any involvement in the killings. If you have any information regarding the West Mesa murders, Albuquerque Crime Stoppers is still offering a $100,000 reward. You can call 505-768-2450, that's 505-768-2450, or you can call Crime Stoppers at 505-843-STOP, that's 505-843-STOP. I've also placed those phones in the episode description as well. On July 2, 1951, Pansy Carpenter, the landlord of the Alamanda apartment building in St. Petersburg, Florida, was awoken early in the morning by a dull thud. The sound was similar to that of a door closing. She investigated the noise but found nothing out of the ordinary, apart from the rising smell of smoke. Assuming it was the dodgy electric pump she kept in her garage, she checked to make sure that it was switched off. A little later on, around 6 a.m., a telegram arrived for Mary Reeser, one of the building's residents. Pansy decided to deliver the message to Mary. This was when Pansy realized she couldn't hear the radio playing from within Mary's apartment, which she always heard around this time in the morning. As she approached, she felt the prickle of heat emanating through the screen door. Spontaneous human combustion has been a morbidly fascinating topic that has confounded and intrigued the human mind for centuries. The idea was propelled into the mainstream when Charles Dickens released a 20-episode serial novel, Bleak House. Within the novel, one of the characters, the alcoholic Mr. Crook, is killed off by means of spontaneous human combustion. The public at the time trusted Dickens and his portrayal of spontaneous human combustion as his other novels contained scientific matters such as smallpox and brain damage explained with great accuracy. But what is spontaneous human combustion? Spontaneous human combustion, or SHC, is the proposal that the human body can, quite literally, spontaneously combust into flames, without being ignited by an external heat source. However, those who have allegedly died this way have not simply perished in a fire that has also consumed their surroundings. The blaze seems to be contained around the body, 
only tarnishing close items such as a chair or rug. When we imagine or see within movies and TV shows someone being engulfed by flames, they writhe in agony, screaming as their flesh bubbles from their bones. But in the few cases that have been, somewhat loosely, dubbed as SHC, no one, such as neighbors, hear anything that resembles someone being set on fire. So how is it possible for a person to burst into flames seemingly in silence? According to an article from an online course run by Forensic Archaeology and Anthropology, the phenomenon is not quite spontaneous combustion, but instead a slower process that causes the human body to burn in small pieces known as the wick effect. The wick effect is described as a low-intensity fire that spreads across the body, causing the body's fats to melt. As the body fat melts, it seeps into the victim's clothing, creating a grotesque inside-out candle. This turns the body into a fuel source and the outer clothes into the wick. The slow burn then causes the body to effectively disintegrate into fragments. The disintegration isn't due to the flames, but rather the older age of the victims. Their bones would be weaker and more porous. As the flames spread over the body, they begin to die down once they reach the elbows and knees. These regions are less fatty and don't produce as much fuel, so the lower legs and feet are left relatively undamaged. With regards to the victims seemingly allowing the flames to ravage their bodies, chances are they've already died from natural causes. Due to the low intensity of the fire, the remainder of the room in which the victim is found remains more or less untouched. Mary Reeser's landlord, Pansy, panicked and called out to two painters who were working across the street for help. One of the men entered Mary's apartment and spotted a pile of smoldering ash. Within it, he saw the lower half of Mary Reeser's leg and one of her black slippers. The case of Mary Reeser stunned the authorities at the time, including the chief of the fire department. Not only had Mary's charred remains been left behind in a seemingly well-contained fire, but the paint on the wall behind the chair that she'd been sitting in remained untouched. The chair had been practically reduced to ash, along with part of the rug that was situated under the chair. The smoke from the fire had blackened the upper walls and the ceiling, but there seemed to be no damage to the floor or on the lower walls. It rings eerily similar to the wick effect, but Mary isn't the only victim of this fiery phenomenon. In 1885, on Christmas Eve in Seneca, Illinois, Matilda Rooney burst into flames in her kitchen. The fire incinerated her full body apart from her feet. A further tragedy, her husband also died. His cause of death was smoke inhalation from his spontaneously combusted wife. An investigation into Matilda's uncanny death produced more questions than answers. There was no other ignition source found at the scene, along with no detection of foul play, and the rest of their home was untouched by the fire, despite the fact that Matilda's body was reduced mostly to ash and a few bone fragments. On December 22, 2010, in Galway, Ireland, 76-year-old Michael Faraday's burnt body was found by his neighbor after black smoke set off Faraday's fire alarm at 3 a.m. After banging on the door and receiving no response, the neighbor called the fire brigade. Forensic experts found that apart from Michael's charred body, the only other damage to the room was the ceiling above his body and the floor directly below him. What was left of his body was found in front of a fireplace, but the fireplace itself was not the cause of the blaze. Michael Faraday's cause of death was officially ruled as spontaneous human combustion by coroner Dr. McLaughlin. This was the first case in Ireland's history attributed to SHC. Another case in Dublin, Ireland, happened before Faraday in 1970, but remained off of the SHC radar. Even though the cause of death was ruled as burning, the cause of the fire was ruled as unknown. Margaret Hogan was an 89-year-old widow who lived alone. She was frequently visited by her neighbor, who had been by to wash Margaret's hair and feet the night before her ashy remains were discovered. The neighbor left Margaret sitting in an armchair by the fire, seemingly in good health. Yet at 9.30 the next morning, Margaret was nothing more than ash except for her two feet. Again, no accelerants were found in the home. 
Only Margaret, the armchair, and part of the rug were affected by the fire, and the small coal fire she had in her home was ruled out to have been the cause. Connor Brady was the first reporter on the scene that March 28, 1970. He was quoted as saying, the lady had been reduced to a little pile of ashes. It was just two little ankles sticking out. Dublin coroner Patty Bofin became intrigued by the case. He concluded that Margaret Hogan died from burning, but burning that was closely associated with spontaneous human combustion. Bofin added that the term does not mean that the fires are in fact spontaneous in origin. It's simply a term carried on in forensic literature to describe a set of circumstances in which a person is burned to death without an obvious source for the fire. One theory that arose from Margaret's untimely death is that a spark from the coal fire could have ignited Margaret's clothes, but the fact that her body was almost completely destroyed without causing any further damage to the rest of the room is almost incomprehensible. Those who've lost their lives to this bizarre phenomenon do have a few things in common. They were all elderly and found near a fire source. Additionally, they all consumed alcohol and smoked. Their hands or feet were untarnished by the fire that engulfed the rest of their body, with no extensive damage to the rest of the room. But is it possible that these people did quite literally spontaneously burst into flames with no direct ignition source? Or do the attributes of the victim's deaths hold a candle to the wick effect, a slow, low-intensity fire that effectively transitions your body from a fleshy mass to an inside-out, highly flammable candle? There are certainly conflicting thoughts on both of these phenomena, from the scientific community to those who love a good, morbid tale. It may be safe to say that spontaneous human combustion will remain one of life's burning mysteries. When Weird Darkness returns, have you seen the mischievous spirits of Tinker Swiss Cottage or met Galena's Lady in Black? Perhaps you've had a run-in at DeKalb's Egyptian Theater. These are all areas within a short distance of each other northwest of Chicago that can give the Windy City spooks a run for their money. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich. And that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. It was 1862, and Robert Hall Tinker was enthralled. The future Rockford, Illinois mayor was visiting Switzerland and had fallen in love with the country's architecture. Three years later, he began to create a little piece of Switzerland of his own on a bluff overlooking Kent Creek in Rockford. The completed cottage, known today as the Tinker Swiss Cottage, is an architectural gem that combines Swiss, Gothic, and Victorian styles. Tinker carried his first wife, Mary, over the threshold in April 1870. 
then mourned at her funeral in the parlor 31 years later. In 1904, he married Jessie, and four years after that, became a father at 71 to an adopted son. Tinker lived a long and prosperous life, serving as Rockford's mayor, ushering in the city's first public library, perfecting his sketches and paintings, and creating a lush landscape around his 27-acre estate. In 1924, at 88 years old, Robert Hall Tinker died in his beloved cottage. Some say he never quite left, though. Paranormal places abound in this region. They're filled with fun stories of spectral sightings that continue to entice our curiosities. Whether or not you believe in ghosts, these spirits still like to make their stories known. The Tinker home, complete with the family's furnishings and possessions, became a public museum in 1943. Samantha Hochman, executive director of the Tinker Swiss Cottage Museum and Gardens, knows Tinker, his family, and the home's staff through entries he wrote in his diary. But she also says that she has met them personally. We see the ghosts regularly, says Hochman. There are a lot of times when I'm here by myself and I'll see somebody walk by the doorway or peek around the corner. More often than not, she thinks that that somebody is Robert Tinker himself. Robert was a prankster in life, and he likes to continue being a prankster, Hochman says. He'll often move the silverware around on the dining table because he knows it drives me nuts. Hochman and her team are good sports about the hijinks. Ghost tours, particularly during the Halloween season, bring the public together with paranormal experts and investigators. Historian, librarian, and author Kathy Cressall leads haunted tours around Rockford, including stops at Tinker Cottage. She even welcomed the ghosts as guests to her wedding, which was held in the cottage's parlor. The former director was definitely open to letting people investigate, but Samantha has taken it to a whole new level, says Cressall. She's been here to confirm things like how Robert smoked a cigar when we smell cigar smoke. She's right here, on hand, when things happen, and it really helps. Hookman's knowledge of Tinker's diaries often comes in handy like the time she and Cressall investigated frequent sightings of a ghostly little blonde girl. There was an orphanage in what is now the parking lot, so we thought she came from there, says Cressall. The Tinkers, particularly Jesse, were really involved with the orphans and would invite them to ice cream socials on the lawn. A breakthrough happened when investigators used a ghost box, a device used by ghost hunters to record sounds and voices from beyond the grave. An electronic voice phenomenon, EVP, called out a name, Maddie. Hookman found the answer in Tinker's diaries. Matilda Anderson used to come to work with her mother, Catherine Anderson, who was a laundress for the family, says Hookman. She died from smallpox when she was around seven years old. Maddie can usually be found downstairs, around the kitchen. It makes sense because that's where her mom would be working, says Hookman. To test their theory, investigators brought a ball into the hallway adjacent to the kitchen. The ball rolled the whole way down that hallway, says Cressel. Tinker's library is another hot spot. This is where we get a ton of EVPs, disembodied voices, shadow figures, or legitimate apparitions, says Hochman. Cressel says visitors have spotted figures in the library's upper level, leaning in to listen to her lecture. Hochman has also had her fair share of encounters. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a daytime tour when everyone's eyes get big and they ask, who is that woman walking behind you? says Hochman. There's activity in every part of the house, but the library is definitely the hottest. Employees have also been startled by the library door when it slams unexpectedly and they're alone in the house. The door doesn't shut unless you really want it to, says Cressall. You have to pick it up and drag it across the carpet. It doesn't close on its own. Sometimes Tinker and his pals like to rain pennies from heaven on their guests. Literally. I don't know where they're getting the pennies, but they throw them straight down from the ceiling, says Hochman. She speculates the upstairs guest bedroom brings lots of sightings because it's where several deaths occurred. Robert's father-in-law moved in and lived here until the end of his life, she says. We also believe this is where Mary's sister Hannah and Mary's niece Marcia passed away, and we're very certain that Jesse's brother Will passed away here. Certain visitors feel vertigo or nausea when they enter the guest room. Disembodied voices are also common. Chris Hall recalls a time when she was alone in the house with the museum's former director. 
We heard a woman call out, hello, during a talk, so he ran up here to investigate, she says. He came back down a lot slower than he went up. No one was there. Tinker's father-in-law has been spotted in the sitting room. We were doing a paranormal tour and a guy spotted a man sitting on the couch, recalls Hokeman. He said, dude, I don't think you're supposed to sit on the furniture. And the man leaned back, looked at him and said, I live here. Later, the visitor recognized the man from a portrait hanging on the wall. In the bedroom belonging to Tinker's first wife, men are often told to leave. Mary was a proper Victorian lady and still doesn't appreciate men entering her domain. If you hear a lady whispering, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, that's Mary, laughs Hokeman. Whatever's going on, Hokeman and her team are more than happy to work around Tinker and his merry band of banshees. We always tell people if they want to investigate ghosts to start here, says Hokeman. They're a group of Caspers here. They're very friendly. Rockford is part of the Rock River Valley, as is Galena, Illinois. Visitors to Galena often feel like they've been whisked back in time when they stroll through downtown with its rich 19th century architecture. With close to a million tourists each year, the town and its residents are accustomed to living guests, but Galena also beckons visitors from beyond the veil. Ted Williams and Robin Davis know all about the ghostly side of Galena. The husband and wife team founded Haunted Galena Tour Company, the city's original haunted tour. Dressed for the part in dark, flowing Victorian costumes, Williams and Davis share a number of ghostly tales that are as meticulously researched as they are hair-raising. Everything that we share is fact-based and historically accurate, says Williams. In a city like Galena, with a history that includes presidents, Civil War heroes, mining rushes, and a period where the population was bigger than Chicago's, it would be easy to exaggerate their tales of terror. But Williams and Davis noticed long ago that hyperbole wasn't needed. In Galena, ghostly history just keeps on repeating. Ghosts are, by their nature, speculative, says Williams, but the same stories keep popping up in the same locations. Adds Davis, people don't know these stories to copy them, she says. They're stories from the 1800s and early 1900s. I don't think they find these stories in the city's archives and then tell us that they had that experience. The first stop on the haunted Galena tour is the DeSoto House Hotel at 230 Main Street. Recognized as one of the oldest operating hotels in Illinois, the DeSoto House opened in 1855 and quickly became Galena's social hub. The hotel has hosted luminaries like Mark Twain, Susan B. Anthony, and Booker T. Washington, while also serving as the political headquarters of Ulysses S. Grant during his presidential run and the sleeping spot for presidents like Abraham Lincoln. Theodore Roosevelt and William McKinley. Some of its guests, however, have yet to check out, like the Lady in Black, the hotel's most famous ghost who prowls the basement. She wears a black dress, black veil, and black gloves, which is a Civil War-era outfit, says Williams. The Lady in Black's true origins aren't known, but Williams has a theory. When the war breaks out, Lincoln calls for volunteer troops in 1861, he says. Here in Galena, there are efforts to recruit young men to the cause. One of the recruits was not a young man at all. Bushrod Howard was a former state senator, an ex-harbor master, and the acting postmaster in Galena. He'd served alongside General Grant during the Mexican-American War and was anxious to answer the call. His wife Helen was much less enthused. When she finds out, it doesn't go well, says Williams. Helen is so angry at Bushrod that she won't speak to him. Her anger simmers through Howard's three months of basic training and is still white-hot when Bushrod and the rest of the 1st Company of the 19th Illinois Regiment is called to Washington. She won't speak to him, says Williams. She turns her back when he tries to say goodbye to her at the train station. Julia Grant, the wife of General Grant, witnesses this and writes about it in her diary. Their train never reaches its destination. While they were crossing a ravine in southern Indiana, a trestle bridge collapsed and the men plunged to their deaths. After ten days, the bodies were brought back to Galena and stored in the coldest spot in town, the basement of the DeSoto house. Shortly after this, the Lady in Black begins appearing in the basement. Is the Lady in Black Bushrod's heartbroken widow? Is she the wife 
sweetheart, sister, or mother to one of the other men killed in the crash? The answer remains unknown. She's often spotted in one room in particular, where she drifts across the room, fogging up glassware with her chilling presence and then seemingly disappearing into a solid wall. In 2011, a massive rainstorm caused flooding in the hotel basement, leading to a major renovation. When workers tore down the Lady in Black's favored wall, they discovered an ancient doorway that had been sealed in. The doorway is now on prominent display in what is now General's Restaurant, with a decorative plaque to tell the story of the Lady in Black. Haunted Galena Touring Company has other sinister tales about the DeSoto house. There are a number of rooms here that are consistently haunted, says Williams. There are a lot of different apparitions and forces here. Guests on the third floor will sometimes call the front desk, complaining of loud parties going on above them. They'll say, there are people up there dancing, stomping their feet and playing a fiddle, grins Williams. Prior to 1880, the DeSoto house was a five-story building, but after a major renovation, the top two floors were removed. There was a ballroom on the fourth floor, says Williams. The residual energy of people partying and having fun is apparently happening in a spectral sense. I can assure you that in February there isn't a hoedown happening on the roof. The next stop on the tour is the old Market House, a two-story Greek revival building that was a bustling commercial hub during Galena's heyday. Completed in 1846, the building also served as the seat of local government and had two jail cells in its basement. After serving for a time as a visitor center, the building now sits abandoned. Almost. During the city's Riverport days, Mary Ann Miller arrived by steamship with her escort, Jacob. The night she arrived, they were at the local taverns, drinking and dancing, recounts Davis. Then they started brawling. They were quickly arrested and taken to jail. The next morning, Mary Ann Miller and Jacob were escorted to the pier and told to leave town. Only Jacob complied. Mary Ann Miller stuck around Galena, drinking, carousing, and causing all kinds of mayhem. She was arrested again. This time, however, she was tossed in one of the jail cells at the old market house. She was an unaccompanied woman, so the jailer wouldn't throw her in prison with the other men, says Davis. Sometime in the night, there was a torrential rainstorm. The river jumped its banks and the streets began to flood. Trapped in her jail cell, Mary Ann Miller drowned. She was found on the floor of her cell the next day and was buried in an unmarked grave. Today, people still claim to see Mary Ann Miller walking the streets near the old market house and the cemetery. They also say they hear her in the basement, yelling and swearing at anyone who comes near. While the building was being refurbished as a welcome center, a worker was terrorized so badly that he ran from the site and never returned. Following the Welcome Center's grand opening, a woman was trapped in the basement washroom and was mysteriously released after a terrifying few minutes. Later that night, she tearfully recounted her experience on a haunted Galena ghost tour. She proceeded to tell everyone what happened to her in the basement of this building, recalls Williams. Mary Ann Miller is still here. Williams also has stories of knocking on the basement door at the back of the building, only to hear Mary Ann Miller knocking back. She's also known to park herself near one of the building's air vents, using it to whisper sinister somethings in an assuming visitor's ear. It's like she grabbed you and is whispering right in your ear, says Williams. It is extremely unsettling. If there is one happy ending to the tragic tale of Mary Ann Miller, it's that the women of Galena took a stand to ensure the city of Galena no longer used the old market house jail cells to hold prisoners. Not one person was locked in the jail cells in the market house again, says Davis. No one should die that way. Elsewhere in the Rock River Valley for almost a century, residents of DeKalb County, Illinois have been flocking to the Egyptian Theater, 135 North 2nd Street in DeKalb. When it opened in 1929, it was one of more than a hundred theaters of its kind and a tribute to the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922, which sparked a nationwide fascination with Egypt. Today, only seven Egyptian-themed theaters remain, with DeKalb's being the only one east of the Rocky Mountains. A member of the National Register of Historic Places, a top-20 architectural treasure in Illinois, and a fully modernized venue, 
It's such a popular theater that some simply refuse to leave. Just ask Jeannie Holcomb, communications and marketing director since 2017. We had a ghost tour last Friday, and when we were in the dressing room, we heard footsteps going across the stage, she says. It was perfection. The stage is one of the most haunted spots in the 1400-seat theater, which means that acts like Cheap Trick, Ray Charles, and Jay Leno, or visiting dignitaries like John F. Kennedy, might have shared the stage with a shadowy co-star. We have at least one ghost on the stage that we know about, says Holcomb. His name is Charles or Charlie or Chuck. That's what a medium told us. Charles has been spotted on numerous separate occasions, including by the theater's executive director, Alex Nerud. He was working here by himself late at night, recalls Holcomb. He turned around, and there was a man in a navy blue or black mechanics jumpsuit. He was leaning on a broom or mop. They made eye contact, and the man disappeared. Charlie has also been known to shake the ropes that raise and lower lights and set pieces. He stalks across the stage and sometimes scatters the contents of garbage cans. There's a lot of mischief, but the ghosts are very friendly, says Holcomb. The Egyptian theater, like Tinker Swiss Cottage, wears its ghostly activity on its sleeve. Holcomb frequently hosts haunted tours and welcomes paranormal investigators to sweep the venue with electronic equipment. Like Williams and Davis of Galena, Holcomb is struck with the oft-repeated tales. Some of our ghosts are on our Wikipedia page, but Charlie is not, says Holcomb. There's just this repetition that is really interesting. I can't explain it. What she can explain is the continuing connection with Irv Kummerfeld, one of the co-founders of Preservation of the Egyptian Theater, the group that was instrumental in the theater's 1980s restoration. Kummerfeld often stayed behind after shows to help clean the venue. It was during one of these cleanups that he suffered a fatal heart attack in aisle one. He's very active, says Holcomb. We see a lot of shadow figures in aisle one, and we saw a video from one of the investigators of someone walking. According to a psychic, Kummerfeld is still passionate about his beloved theater and does what he can to keep it ship-shape. He's our guardian angel, says Holcomb. He's making sure that all the work he put in is still going today. Also in the audience is the woman in the green dress, who's been spotted in the balcony. We think that she's an actress, says Holcomb. We had a medium tell us that she knows she's dead. This is just her happy place. Holcomb has also observed the ghosts seem more agitated when the theater experiences turbulence. When we were in the pandemic, they were very anxious, she says. When everything's going well, they chill out. Sometimes we tell them, it's okay, we're under control. The most haunted part of the theater, however, is the dressing room. Holcomb, who has danced at the theater since she was a child, has always avoided one of the stalls in the women's washroom. It gives me the heebie-jeebies, she laughs. The door is slammed shut and there have been bangs on the walls of the stall. There's a lot of energy out of that stall. Holcomb has also experienced phantom touches on her back while in the dressing room. She also claims that the spirit of a little boy roams the dressing room area and has scared a group that had ironically set up a haunted attraction in the basement. We had a medium tell us that he likes to hang out in dressing room one, says Holcomb. Given the theater's nearly century-long history, it's little surprise to Holcomb that the Egyptian theater has attracted those who refuse to leave. It's such an emotional space, whether you're a performer or you just enjoy the arts, says Holcomb. It's a place where your soul is fed, so to have that energy remain is pretty powerful. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. The West Mesa Bone Collector was written by Kelsey Christine McConnell for the lineup. Lurid Locations, Spooky Spots, and Paranormal Places is by Marcus Louth for UFO Insight. The Bizarre Phenomenon of Spontaneous Human Combustion is by Rachel Elizabeth for the lineup. Rock River's Residual Revenants is by Jim Taylor for the Northwest Quarterly. 
Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 29, verse 23. A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. And a final thought. Free will is not the liberty to do whatever one likes, but the power of doing whatever one sees ought to be done, even in the very face of otherwise overwhelming impulse. There lies freedom indeed. George MacDonald I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.